Ladies and gentlemen, please turn your attention to the stage as we begin our session. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your panel on Building Better Cities and Scaling Housing Solutions, moderated by Vice President of Global Philanthropy at J.P. Morgan Chase, Diane Helfrey. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our conversation. And actually, welcome to LA for all of those of you who traveled here um, on behalf of people like me who live and work here. Um, sorry, the weather isn't better. <laughs> Would have ordered that up if we could. Um, as mentioned, I'm on the global philanthropy team at J.P. Morgan Chase, um, and which is part of our overall corporate responsibility efforts at the firm. Um, I was really excited to hear that the theme of this conference is driving shared prosperity, because our firm strategy and our efforts is, are really kind of oriented around inclusive economic growth. And we feel it's very important to help more people move up the economic ladder. A key element of doing that is revitalizing neighborhoods to build better cities. So with us today are our distinguished panelist, Ross Duvall, uh, to my far right. Um, among his uh, depth of experience, Ross has actually been ranked among the superstars of think tank scholars by International Economy Magazine. Mary Mack, head of consumer banking at Wells Fargo, has been named one of Fortune's 50 most powerful women in business, and twice as number one on America Banker's uh, 25 women to watch list. Jonathan Rose, um, among his other accolades, has received MIT's Visionary Leadership Award, um, and Jesse Vaughn, uh, who was recently named to Forbes 30 under 30 list. So really, like, who needs the Avengers when we have these people <laughs> addressing our <laughs> solutions? <laughs> Housing endgame. Um, so <clears throat> diving in, uh, we know that a robust supply of housing is a fundamental element in any community development strategy that aims to facilitate economic mobility and equity. But 10 years after the Great Recession, solutions that, solutions that address housing accessibility are still scarce. Many Americans still face daunting challenges, um, particularly when it comes to financial barriers when trying to access housing, especially in our big cities and metro areas. The rising cost of housing, driven in part by lack of supply, which is then exacerbated by restrictive zoning policies and other barriers, is contributed to many issues that people experience, including stress, um, overcrowding of, of living, uh, conditions, burdensome commutes when people are forced to move farther from where they work, and it continues to, uh, to strain overall economic mobility and productivity. So when we think about the housing crisis that's being felt today across the country, a major issue is affordability. And we can divide the topic into three kind of tiers. Um, supportive housing for people experiencing homelessness or other conditions requiring housing plus supportive services. The capital A, affordable housing with explicit subsidies and mandates. And housing that's naturally affordable across the spectrum of all income levels. Um, so just to set some context initially, if we could have this first slide. Um, <coughs> The home ownership rate, if you look uh, over time, has, has really went up for quite a while, but then has gone down um, over the last decade or so. And the next slide. Um, in California, as an example, this goes back even farther, but you can see there was a big, big rise in uh, mid-century, and then since uh, 2000, it's really started to decline again. Um, so that creates some of the context, um, and we'll show a little bit more data. In fact, Ross, can you start us off uh, with an overview of the affordability across the country to help everyone understand the scale and scope of the problem and the relationship between economic growth and the housing issue? Well, thank you very much. I very much appreciate the opportunity to do that. Um, what we've seen since uh, the Great Recession uh, if we go to slide four, I think it's a good example of that. It shows the ratio of median housing cost to median household income, but for renters. So that's what we're looking at here. And 
Now, what's really happened is we've had so much of our overall economic growth based on technology and specific clusters around the country. You know, we economic geographers have you know, looked at the factors that drive uh, knowledge to concentrate in places and the productivity gains from that associated with that versus the forces of dispersion, some would call them centrifugal, pushing things out. And clearly, the centripetal forces drawing things in in concentration, we have found uh, increasing returns to knowledge inside dense locations. So what we've seen from that is so much of the technology-driven growth along the coast, especially in California, um, San Francisco, San Jose, Portland, Seattle, uh, San Diego, but, but even along the East Coast, Boston, uh, all the way down to New York and Maryland. And you're seeing that in, in Raleigh, Durham as well, um, showing up there in orange. So largely this is manifested in places that have had strong economic growth, very dense, with very limited additional availability of land. You combine that with restrictive zoning ordinances and regulations, and quite frankly, a bit of nimbyism. You know, not in my backyard. And you've seen rents rise appreciably. And we haven't yet figured out how to solve this, but to be honest, part of me says it's a real opportunity for the center of the country because that's where I reside now and that's my mission. And what it says, and if you look at millennials especially, there's evidence that they're beginning to leave the coasts. And this hasn't been noticed much. You would only see it by looking at domestic net migration, excluding foreign immigration. If you look at domestic net migration, young people are leaving the coasts. And it's a new phenomenon. They have been coming to the coasts uh, since the Great Recession. But when an apartment, a two-bedroom apartment in San Francisco, San Jose, and the outlying areas goes for five to six thousand dollars a month, you have to earn, you know, two hundred thousand to be able to stay there. And if you if you don't have the potential to be in the money, to have options that can be cashed in at some point, and you're beginning to start a family. Um, you've got to question whether that's the right lifestyle for you. And so there is early evidence that many millennials are leaving the coasts and moving back to other parts of the country. So as I said somewhat flippantly is that part of me says this is an opportunity for what we're trying to do, but we can't forget the people who live on the coasts and what the challenges are. So w whenever you're concentrating more wealth and people and places, land rents get bid up, and they've really been bid up. So I mean, this is, this is the challenge that California faces especially. I mean, I've worked here for 20 years. I, I came up with alternative affordable housing policies. The good news is Governor Newsom is now backing many of them. I wish it had been somebody who listened 20 years ago. It wouldn't be quite a, the mess it is today. But there are some encouraging things happening, and there's a, an appeal process um, in, in California now that allows for uh, developers to come in, and even if the, um, the neighborhood is opposed to it, there is an alternative pathway. But I mean, that's, that's the premise of the problem. Let me just show you one more map, because I think this really gets to the tiers of housing. Um, let, let's, let's go to slide five, please. This is a bit different. This is a share of homeowning households that make less than 50,000 in income that spend more than 30% on housing. And if you're in red, it means you spend 61% to 82% of your monthly income on housing. I mean, that, that is just not sustainable, and you see the red and where it's concentrated. And this is a problem we need to fix because firefighters, policemen, school teachers, they can't afford to live in these places. And they're having to move farther out. 
commute longer distances, which increases congestion, and it doesn't add to your quality of life, and it's more difficult to get good teachers and keep them. So that's kind of the, the nature of the problem and how we got here. Now we've got to figure out how to solve it. Great. So Jonathan, <clears throat> can you uh, elaborate on uh, Ross's comments and particularly the gap between de demand and supply, especially in the affordable housing space and market rate housing that's affordable? Great. Thank you. So um, interestingly, this is a problem that traditionally the way to solve it is to build our way out of it. In the 1970s, we did not have an affordable housing problem at all because we actually had excess production. The um, uh, insufficient production started in the late 1990s, it's around 2000. We've been underproducing housing at all levels every year, and that has accumulated to, uh, to the deficit we have today. So. 20 million Americans today spend more than 50% of their income on housing. And approximately 11 million of those Americans are renters and 9 million of those are homeowners. The, uh, this chart is really, really important because what it's showing is that people who are earning under $50,000 a year or under 60% of an area median income typically um, is a sig have a significant share in spending more than this 30 to so we think 30% of your income on housing is the right number. Now what's interesting is when you live in crummy housing, you also spend significantly a higher percentage of your income on utilities. Mm -hmm. um, in places where people, low-income people need to he pay for their own heat, they can be spending five or $600 a month on heat, which they often cut back on. That leads to all kinds of other health issues. Um, this also leads by, and then the last thing is that um, uh, because of the lack of availability of affordable housing in the places where it's need, where the jobs are, poor people live farther away. The Center for Neighborhood Technology has done some very interesting work on the relationship between housing cost and transportation cost. And so poor people, because they need credit, in effect, so they're spending less on rent, so they're living much farther away, and then they're spending much more on transportation, either on the cost of owning cars or on mass transit, so in the LA area, people under $50,000 a year are spending over 90 minutes a day each way getting to and from work, which means they can't be at home to tutor their kids and they can't be um, uh, you know, members of the PTA, they can't be voices in their community, et, et cetera. Um, just as a sub-factor, the, um, there are 12%, it's estimated, of the people who work at Disneyland are homeless and live in their cars and shower in the company locker rooms. These are people who are working. So although, yes, we have mentally ill homeless and we have low-income seniors, by the way, trying to live on Social Security of eleven or $12,000 a year, completely are priced out of this housing market. So, um, uh, But also you have uh, a lot of hardworking people who simply cannot afford a place to live. So I'm going to underscore what Ross said, which is the solution has to be higher production. The higher production has to be next to mass transit to solve both the environmental and economic issues of transportation. And, um, and the only solution to that is higher density. And we need the political will to do that. Now what's interesting is, because as Ross mentioned, people earning $120,000 a year in the Bay Area can't afford to live there and, and many other places. Um, Whereas this used to be considered a minority problem, it actually wasn't because there's more low-income white families in America than low-income minority families. But it was considered to be a, um, uh, a minority issue. It is now clearly an everybody issue and certainly a majority family issue. And that means that there's a rising political consensus. So I'll end with when I started in this work in the 1970s, if you made a list of the top 25 most important issues to people, affordable housing was probably number 23, if not number 25. And today, city by city across America, and it's not just on the coast, it's Columbus, Ohio, and it's, it's, all, it's all over America, affordable housing is issue number one in the local elections. Right. And if we can broaden that to national, we can build a constituency. Absolutely. And just to, <coughs> excuse me, throw in another statistic or two on, on the homeless issue. Um, in California, uh, there's an estimated uh, roughly 20% of community college students that are either homeless or housing insecure, which is kind of a shocking number when you think about the size of our community college system here. And in LA, when we do the homeless count for the county, 
Uh, last year it dipped down a little bit because we are putting resources toward the homeless issue. However, some of the, the fastest increasing subsets of that population were seniors um, and first time homelessness. So um, it's really kind of staggering when you start to unpeel like the different subsets of, of individuals that we don't typically think um, have that particular uh, issue. Um, so Mary, what else would you add from your perspective um, that's not strictly housing related, but other factors that contribute in terms of, for instance, wage or income growth? So it's some of the things that you mentioned and Jonathan mentioned, which is the trade-off decisions that families are having to make around um, health care, uh, nutrition, things that are fundamental in school systems for school success, so you see it in issues that kids are having in classrooms, which then carry forward. Um, but you also see it uh, in uh, millennials, for instance. 40% of, the, on average, of a millennial's household income is going to housing, which delays the ability to begin to save. Mm -hmm. uh, and we know that that has impact long term for um, the ability to be retirement ready at some point. Um, or the fact that elders will, uh, 75 and older, will double in the next 10 years. And it's estimated that half of those will have um, issues with both health care and housing costs. So it's not just today's problem, it's tomorrow's problem in, um, in a way that's building on itself. Yeah. Hmm. So let's shift a little bit um, to uh, some of the solutions. <laughs> Framing the problem, it's a big problem, uh, number one on a lot of people's minds across the country. Um, so clearly the supply is one big factor that's driving <coughs> uh, the cost of housing. But there are other challenges that exacerbate that, um, including accessibility to financing. So let's dive into kind of the consumer and financing side of the equation a bit more. Um, so Jesse, your business at Landed, <coughs> excuse me, is <clears throat> an interesting customer-focused example, uh, helping people live near where they work and uh, tackling the finance side of the equation. Cause, so can you give an overview of your model and, and tell us like how you thought about developing that and, and what it looks like now? Yeah, sure. I, I think one thing to just say at the outset when we talk about solutions is, um, <clears throat> in particular, when we talk about our solution, we're careful to caveat that we're not a panacea. So. We're not a silver bullet. Um, that being said, we, we've identified one particular thread of the issue, which is that the ability in these, in these high cost markets, the barrier to home ownership for many individuals is not necessarily affordability. There are, there are many individuals who can't afford an 80% LTV conforming loan, but there are many who can, but can't manage to access that mortgage because in these high cost markets, it's all but required to have a 20% down payment. And then for many of those individuals who uh, can get to the 20%, uh, they either have family support, so there's, a, um, there's a, a, an equality issue uh, as well, so bank of mom and dad. Um, and, there's, uh, and, and many of even those individuals are very financially vulnerable um, once they've dumped all of their savings into uh, a down payment. What we identified as a, a needed solution or a, a tool in the toolbox, if you will, is a form of down payment support. And what we offer is ordinarily half of a 20% down payment will provide 10% of the home cost uh, upfront in exchange for 25% of that property's appreciation when the home is sold. And we raise capital from impact-oriented investors, some foundations, institutional uh, investors. Um, and we offer, our, um, we offer our programs, our down payment support, uh, to a category of individuals we call essential professionals. The first group of which are uh, public school teachers and school staff, uh, as well as public colleges, um, the staff who work in them. Um, and we, we've decided to focus on, on this demographic um, for, for a variety of reasons, uh, but not the least of which because we think that they're essential to our community. We actually, also we love working with them, frankly. They're a great demographic. They're incredibly um, great credit risks that don't always show up in the, in the credit metrics. So, I mean, if, uh, 
if you had a, a teacher or anyone else at the same credit score, um, I'm willing to bet that their, the teacher's job is more secure than average. Um, so, so I think there's a lot of virtues that are not uh, in working with this demographic that are not necessarily uh, captured in conventional um, underwriting processes. Um, but yeah, today we operate in, uh, in, in high cost markets across the country, San Francisco Bay Area, uh, Los Angeles, Orange County, and San Diego County, as well as we have active programs in Seattle, Washington, and, uh, and, and Denver. And, and a question that often comes up is, um, is this really a solution? Is this something that people can, can utilize? Can a teacher buy a home? It seems just crazy, um, it, some of the pessimists might say. Um, and it is really hard. But in the last year, we've supported over 175 teachers uh, purchase homes. Um, most of them, I will say, are dual income, so either two teachers in a household or a teacher and a, and a, um, a partner. Um, or more, sometimes there are uh, larger households. Um, but we've, we've helped them across the country, including purchasing in San Francisco, San Mateo County, Oakland, uh, downtown Denver, um, uh, Seattle and Bellevue, Washington. Um, so it's working, and there, there, there are solutions out there. Um, but again, they're not, they're not panaceas. And um, yeah, not panaceas, at least like supply would be a panacea, but there's <laughs> the political will to get there might be a little more challenging than to kind of lob off these um, one-offs. So what are you learning from the investor perspective in terms of appetite to you know, invest to help the community more broadly or you know, help particular populations? Any insights that could be translated to other types of solutions? So one thing I'll, I'll say there is that when we first got started, we, we started the company in 2015, and it, it took about a year and a half, two years to get the partnerships in place in order to do what we wanted to do, as well as uh, ca raise capital. Um, there's a lot of stakeholders in a home purchase transaction to get coordinated, and not a lot of time to execute. An ordinary home close date, in a highly competitive market, you have to bid, and then you have to close in 30 days. So we had to bring together um, First lenders, because they had to be on board with whom uh, was providing all of the, the down payment funds. Escrow companies, um, we had to, in, in certain states, title companies are separate. Um, and in, in the investors who were putting up the capital. Um, so, as well as unions and employers and all, all of these other stakeholders. As far as the investor's perspective, what we have actually seen, at least that I have seen in the last three years, is a transition in how impact is appreciated and interpreted. When we first started, we got advice from a, a, a real estate developer, whom will remain unnamed, a large manager of capital, who said, I love what you're doing, but you should take out the impact slide from your capital raising deck. People will just you know, brush over it. They'll write you off because they'll think that your financing is concessionary if you put that in the, in, in, in the deck. When we truly believe that our, our financing provides market rate returns, we have chosen to focus on a, a demographic that provides impact to our communities. But that is a lot of words to explain to someone when you're asking for a million dollars or $10 million or $50 million. Um, because if they write you off in that first 30 seconds, there's no chance of turning back has been our, been our perspective. Today, we, are transi we, we originally had our, our, our success raising capital from foundation uh, investors, so uh, um, invest, uh, foundations who are investing out of their uh, mission-related investment bucket. Um, so this is not grant capital. Um, uh, it is mission-aligned. Um, and now we are transitioning and have had more and more success uh, among a wider audience of um, family offices, institutional uh, investors, endowments, um, people who are impact, or sorry, returns first, impact second. Um, and that has been a transition that at least we have seen in the last uh, two years. Um, I'm very pleased uh, to see um, the conversation has shifted. And I'm reminded of that here uh, at this conference. It seems that also the conversation has shifted. Great. So Mary, as a financial institution, <clears throat> how has the housing crisis informed like how you think about meeting customers' needs and coming up with different types of solutions partnerships or sort of other ways to collaborate to, to contribute to the solutions in so this So let me pick up on something that, that Jesse's talking about, and, and we do it kind of in three ways, but the first one I'll start with is that mission-aligned piece, 
where we can use our foundation. Mm -hmm. So we have looked at where can we really have an impact, where can we make a difference, and how can we use uh, some portion of $444 million that we are investing in uh, organizations, nonprofit organizations across the country to attack this issue. So we set up in partnership with Neighborhood, NeighborWorks America a program that we call LIFT. We have several versions of our LIFT program, but it's all about down payment assistance. And we go into communities, 69 so far, and work with the local nonprofits, the local community partners, local governments. Mayors have been a big part of this because they've designated affordable housing as an issue in their communities and partner with them to uh, host events where we go in and provide down payment assistance anywhere from fifteen to twenty thousand dollars depending on the community and then last year we introduced I was sharing with Jesse earlier we introduced an additional incentive beyond that for teachers first responders veterans um, of twenty five hundred dollars to enhance the down payment assistance and, um, and it, it burns off, so to speak, over a five-year period of time as the new homeowner, largely for new homeowners, mm -hmm. uh, first-time homeowners, burns off for, over a period of time, and it's not necessarily a Wells Fargo mortgage. Two-thirds of them are actually financed by somebody else. We happen to have people there, if that's helpful, but a lot of people come in with a pre-approval from another lender. And, and that works great. The, we set them up online, and they now sign up in five minutes or less for all the appointments over a two-day period. Um, that's about $450 million so far of what we've invested since we started the programs um, and is a big piece of it. But it's also, for instance, in the home lending space, it's new product that addresses, again, some of the things we've been talking about. We, we uh, partnered and introduced a product we call Your First Mortgage, which is um, up to 97% uh, with 3% down, or as little as 3% down, as well as um, uh, a simplified process and the ability to use things that are traditionally non-traditional, non like uh, gifts for down payment or closing costs. So it begins to address some of the alternative forms of, um, uh, of resources that people might bring to the table. Uh, it's home buyer education. It's a big part of Lyft, but it's also a big part of what we do in this first-time homebuyer space. There's a $750 credit to closing costs if you complete HUD-approved uh, uh, education for um, new homebuyers. Mm -hmm. And then um, financial education really more broadly in how do we invest um, across the board. Uh, we've made commitments to diverse communities. Um, uh, Jonathan's right, it's not just a diverse community issue, but you know the rate of um, home ownership for uh, black African-American households, for instance, is at a 30-year low. Mm -hmm. So we've invested with commitments to Hispanic home ownership, $125 billion to Hispanic home ownership over a 10-year period of time, $60 billion to African-American home ownership, and then $70 billion broadly to LMI um, home ownership. Mm -hmm. So that's happening across the retail space, and then in our wholesale organization, we're committed to affordable multifamily investing and lending sort of at the highest level for us. So, yeah, so, so talk more about that in terms of like how are you addressing you know, better access to credit or different, different ways of accessing credit in the, on, on the supply side? So our uh, a wholesale team partners both for uh, low income housing tax credits mm -hmm. as well as um, just affordable uh, uh, multifamily um, ownership and both construction financing as well as long-term financing that enables a cost structure that can make that possible. We partner with Fannie and Freddie and, and um, do that really sort of at the highest level. So that becomes an important supply side activity of, across a wholesale organization. The other factor I think that's an important overlay here, and Mary, you probably know more about this than anyone, is student debt especially for first-time home buyers and the challenges they have in obtaining access to credit. I mean, I've, I've talked to a number of people, family members, friends, children who've you know, lived, worked in New York, they've worked in San Francisco, and with the student loan debt, this talking about millennials, they're really having a challenge in not only, well, basically obtaining credit to, to buy a home, because the student loan has the first 
mm -hmm. priority, right, that has to be paid. Um, have, have you seen some innovative programs that try to address, you know, the, that, the student loan part of this? Because, I mean, there's 1.5 trillion of student loan debt outstanding. Well, and it's contributing, as you mentioned earlier, to this renters phenomenon yeah. To, yeah. to create more time uh, to, um, to begin to address it. We just introduced some um, uh, fed to private financing that allows you to go in only at lower rate to begin to extend those payments to create a little bit of room. Uh, but what we're seeing is, is exactly what you all have referenced, which is a delay in home ownership that allows um, those millennials now to begin to get that under control. It's also the biggest down payment. That's where your first mortgage comes yeah. in for us is to create some space because it doesn't allow for much in down payment. And we, we really do believe that some investment by a new homeowner is, is good for everybody, uh, but it may be as low as 3% if you've got a number of, of people that are coming out of uh, uh, primary or um, advanced education that uh, leaves you with that kind of student debt burden. But you're exactly right in terms of the delay in contributing to the renter's problem. And I think it's important to keep in mind when we talk about delaying home ownership. Home ownership has traditionally been one of the, the ways that people build wealth over time. And so you know, if that is not happening, it has all kinds of downstream implications. As you were talking about in looking into the future, it's not just a today problem, it's a tomorrow problem for retirement, health costs, et cetera. Well, and what's so interesting about that too is through our lift programs, we see that over 40% of the new, because it's largely new homeowners, over 40% of the new homeowners are actually reducing their cost when they go into ownership as opposed mm -hmm. to renting. So it, you know, that's a path that begins to help if we can help them figure out how to start on the that's path. Right. I just want to add that there's also, an, uh, because we are talking about solutions, or we wanted to talk about solutions, there is an opportunity among financial institutions to think creati creatively about the, the issue and also holistically about the borrowers. Uh, what we have seen is that in a lot of the, um, the, the home buyers or borrowers, um, that where they get caught on the student loans, well, one, there's a phenomenon that is, I think, secular, that is people are choosing to delay home ownership. So kind of have to like set that aside and, and yeah. know that there's an uncertain amount of people that are just choosing. I don't actually own a home myself. My, uh, I'm 29, my fiance is 31. We have chosen uh, because um, eventually we'll move closer to home. So there is a, there's a choice. Uh, but that aside, what we're also seeing is even among uh, older um, home buyers, let's say in their, their 30s, who are ready to, to purchase a home but still hold that student debt, where they get caught is on the debt to income ratio qualification. Mm -hmm. um, and, and even if we can help them with the down payment, uh, we uh, indirectly but not directly help them on their ability to pay the monthly total obligations. So what we find is that you can refinance a lot of them, um, coach them around this. If you, if you refinance their student loans, they can bring down their monthly total obligation and then qualify for that loan that they otherwise would not qualify for. You have to be careful because they need to understand it's a lot of complicated moving parts, um, but if you get in there with a, a loan officer or someone that can help them and look at their whole financial picture, mm -hmm. they can help them with both of those uh, options, which have kind of contributing or um, uh, they, they help each other, I guess is what I'm trying yeah. to say. Well, and those two things may not happen simultaneously. Yeah. A lot of times there's a path. Yes. Right, that you've got to get that kind of advice that sets you on a path mm -hmm. that may be two years down the road or whatever it is to begin to get that um, financial uh, picture in order exactly. to allow you to be ready. So that's another thing we're seeing yeah. increasingly is people starting much earlier uh, to begin to, or, or that's the, the hope, is you can yeah. start much earlier to plan for it at the point at which I'm still smarting from the fact that you called older home buyers in their 30s. But <laughs> Thank you for anyway, saying that. Um, I didn't have to apologies. say that. Apologies. <laughs> for, no for offense older intended. home buyers to, to begin to um, uh, to be ready, but you can start much earlier in the readiness uh, journey. Yeah, 100%. So, so let's talk about some other organizations who are, can be part of this equation. Um, so Roth, uh, when we think about you know employers or um, other kind of anchor institutions, there's been several high-profile examples recently of these organizations making some pretty big commitments Very around uh, going into the housing space, and it's related to 
you know, other issues that they care about, employee re um, recruitment, retention, you know, health outcomes for hospital systems and health systems. So they're now stepping up with these commitments. So can you um, touch on some of these and a little bit of how you think that may influence the market going forward? I'm glad to do so. Uh, it's coming both from the private sector and the public sector, philanthropy, as well as uh, major employers. Uh, Microsoft recently committed $500 million to try and uh, improve affordability of housing. Um, they're having a challenge recruiting those top millennial programmers um, because they have the student loan debt. And so uh, I think you're seeing employers like Microsoft. Um, I think Amazon's probably going to do a bit more in this space as well. Uh, and I mean, that's not going to solve the problem by itself. But I think if we, if we address this from multiple angles, we can begin to diminish the severity. Also, the Ford Foundation has stepped up with a major commitment. Um, they're still working out all the details, but it's a range of different types of products. And uh, basically, in the affordable housing space, so we're talking, once again, you know, teachers, firefighters, police officers, um, and I, I think there's a role to play there. To me, it's public-private partnerships that are necessary. And probably more than just the capital, I think the Microsofts and, and others have to show they have skin in the game. But I think they can play an important leadership role in trying to address these. Because when you go to local planning commissions, you try and get the state government involved. And I was involved in this for 20 years here in California. And it's, it, it can be a fist fight. And so when the private sector steps in and takes a leadership role, and they say, well, not only for attraction, but for retention purposes, we have to address this because it becomes a competitive issue for our business, mm -hmm. a survival for our business. In some cases, like Apple, Apple has major operations in Austin the second largest base of employment outside of Silicon Valley now. Um, and actually, I played a role in that. Steve Jobs, when he was still alive, asked me. He knew I did a lot of work in technology centers and where were computer programmers and engineers being created and what was the cost of hiring them, the wages and the housing costs. And I suggested you should take a look at Austin. Now, they did take a look at Austin, and now Austin has almost as many Apple employees as Silicon Valley does. Mm -hmm. So th that's just to emphasize the importance of the dimension of this issue. And I think that private sector employers have to play a role. It's not just about the capital. It's the leadership. And, and once they show up at the table and are part of the discussion, then my term, there's an adult in the room that's trying to supervise things that understands about capital allocation. And interestingly, some of the data in LA says that tech employers, as an example, have been um, better at integrating some employee benefits um, and recognizing the costs and building that into wages, et cetera, whereas other industries have not yet. Correct. Um, so we still have a lot of room to go in terms of uh, employee benefits or going back to the wage issue. We'll put that aside for just a second. <laughs> we can get through some of our other questions, but come back to that, I think, in terms of um, influential actors in the space. Um, so one thing we have not talked as much about at this point is preservation. So Jonathan, can you um, talk about what are you seeing in the preserving mm -hmm. affordable housing, um, again, naturally affordable housing across the spectrum? Are there any best practices that you see are working, or, or what opportunities right. do you see in that space? Great. So um, there are about seven. So seven, seven and a half million units of affordable housing that uh, are vulnerable for preservation. And these are approximately a third are uh, project-based Section 8 pro programs, that were, projects that were built in the late 70s and early 80s, low-income housing tax credit units that were built from 86 onwards, and what we call naturally occurring affordable housing, Class C housing that's just kind of cheap rental. These are all in the rental housing space. And because of the pressures that we're hearing, what's happening is, is the pressure is to turn all this into market rate housing. Our company has an acquisition fund 
that, by the way, was the first uh, impact investment to the Ford Foundation. But because of our return profile, and we're the largest social impact uh, investment of TIA and many others, that um, buys existing affordable housing. We commit to preserve its affordability. And then we make the projects much greener, reducing their climate impacts, their water impacts, and the energy costs for the residents. And then to get to a point that Mary mentioned much earlier is the housing, this is a nexus of issues. So we mentioned transportation, but also health care, um, access to healthy food, access to after school education. So with every one of our projects, we then uh, build a, a health exam room and connect with local health care providers who we're bringing on-site health care. We have computer rooms. We partner with local organizations to provide after-school education and computer training, et cetera, for kids. And uh, English as second language, job training for older people. We're bringing, uh, can, uh, have community gardens, and we're connecting with mobile food banks. We're working, with, uh, we're working on stress reduction because trauma is a very big issue in low-income communities with yoga and meditation, exercise, a whole series of things. So we're using, so number one, we're preserving the affordable housing. Number two, we're using the affordable housing as a platform to connect all these other solutions to. It's actually the most cost-effective way to do that. Now, so what's interesting is that, number one, this field of uh, this effort to actually preserve affordable housing delivers absolute market rate returns. Uh, we're from just, if you look at any real estate investment fund, we're a top quartile return. But what's interesting is in affordable housing is that it's non-correlated. So when the next recession comes, our rents don't go down. They actually are indexed and rise with the CPI. And so that, uh, that gives it a kind of a rock solid uh, ca annual cash flow distribution yeah. plus excellent IRR. So what we're seeing now, though, is that um, so much of the uh, capital that wants to help solve the problem is moving to preservation. Another thing, it costs between $750,000 and a million dollars and seven years to build a new unit in the San Francisco Bay Area. So the city will give a subsidy of $230,000 to somebody who wants to preserve a unit because they can, in effect, preserve four times the units mm -hmm. for the same amount of dollars. What we're seeing, therefore, from the political side is in, in city after city, whether it's New York or LA, Seattle, et cetera, San Francisco, the <clears throat> Denver cities are creating acquisition preservation funds or vehicles to support, to partner with companies like ours. The second thing we're seeing is that, again, because the societal costs are, are so positive, uh, affordable, it, we find if we, for example, give a 30-year commitment to keep a unit affordable, we'll get a 30-year tax abatement. And that actually um, can have substantial economic value to us that then Fannie or Freddie will lend us against that helps make the whole virtuous cycle. So this is, again, like none of these are the complete solution. Mm -hmm. But particularly in dealing with the under 60% of area median income, it's so expensive to build new units. We have such limited uh, financial resources. America builds 50,000 new affordable housing units a year. Remember I said we have a 20 million unit gap, so it's insignificant. So the preservation side is another essential part of the problem. So why do you think we don't hear as much about that? It's well, it's not out there, and <laughs> it's not sexy. Yeah. But but interestingly, for or how could well, we? Well, actually, I will phrase it. Returns that. actually are really good. Yeah. So the um, it's 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 a very financially attractive thing. I think you you, you will hear more about it because we're seeing more and more cities and counties creating preservation programs and trying to enc encourage it. Um, I'll, I can I can leave it at that. Okay. Um, so, Jesse, are you seeing other types of collaboration opportunities or partnerships um, for working with school districts or um, housing developers or other organizations, you know, along the side with some of the ones we've talked about? Yes. I, I think one of the big challenges as a leadership group within our company has been to try and figure out how to retain focus. <laughs> I think there are so many opportunities um, for whether it be collaboration or new product introductions um, that I guess, I, I, to name a few, some of the things that we've, we've already touched on were uh, student loan refinancing. There's a huge opportunity there. Um, 
financial wellness programs, so coaching, um, uh, just liter financial literacy. Um, these, are, um, these are two areas that I think have virtuous feedback effects um, uh, across, across a variety of financial insecurity challenges. For, for us, and we've, and, and we've, we've found that um, the pillar on which we are building our business is, is one of, of trust. And what we have, what we are attempting to do is to build these relationships with school districts, with, um, in certain cases, unions, with uh, teachers um, uh, across the country, and execute really well on what we are trying to do, which is help the sliver of people who can afford to buy a home but can't access that home. And with that trust, then go leverage and provide other su support services. Already today, for the people that cannot buy a home in the next six months or a year, we are still providing financial wellness and coaching to them. We haven't yet monetized that um, aspect of our business. So we, um, we have CFPs we work with, so certified financial planners. We have uh, people on our team who host webinars and uh, how to prepare Homebuyer 101. And then you know, if you're a year out and, and need to refinance your student loans, here are some things you should think about. Or five years out, or 10 years out, just get your budget under control. Um, we believe that if we continue to invest in those, that programming, it will pay off in more partnerships with school districts, employers that will want to work with us, uh, more customers down, down in the pipeline a year out. Um, and, and that is, um, but that area is, 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 a, is a massive challenge to kind of balance focus <laughs> on what we are already executing well on and, um, and planning for the future and other products uh, and, and platforms we can um, deliver. Great. So let's shift uh, to kind of an open conversation here around policy. Um, <clears throat> so clearly we've established there's, there's a lot of things going on, there, but there's also a lot of barriers that remain. And we need both long-term solutions and intermediate-term solutions to tackle the issue. So uh, unfortunately, that oftentimes, is, as we've heard, uh, runs into local resistance, um, nimbyism, et cetera, to get beyond that. So what would you advise policymakers regarding uh, how to come up with effective state policies and solutions to incentivize supply in the short term and the long term? Anyone want to lead off? Rob? Let me take the more macro perspective on it early on, and then we get into more of the specifics. But I've worked with developers over the years, and the biggest obstacle they face is the uncertainty of how long is it going to take to get the permits. And so I, I've, I've spoken to them and say, if I knew it was going to be a year and two months, I can deal with that. But it's the uncertainty of sometimes it could be six months. E even in the same location, the state of California might take six months, and somewhere else it might take a year and a half. And so it seems to me we need to use information technology more thoroughly. Uh, but also looking at the planning process more holistically and all those points of contact kind of have to be put together to expedite this process and make it more efficient. And that is what's largely been absent here in California. You see the same thing on the East Coast as well. But there needs to be a monitoring system and tracking online so you can go check and see where you're at in the permit review process, what's the next review that's, that's coming up. And we need to hold state and local officials accountable. There needs to be a scorecard, a set of metrics. If you don't measure it, you'll never improve upon it. And it's, it's not something that has been monitored very closely. And I think if we can instill that into the process, and you can do that, I, I think you can take a lot of costs out of the system. And then the affordable housing, um, either the rate of return is higher or it doesn't cost as much. So that's, that's a major policy that, frankly, wouldn't cost us any money. And I would say it would 
make the process more efficient, reducing government costs. So th there are things that we can do. And then, of course, you face the local opposition uh, that's it's always a challenge to overcome. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's certainly one approach we can take. So c do you have some specific examples of what that would look like in terms of a policy recommendation or um, who, you know, where would that be initiative, initiated? So, yeah, so Denver's actually done this. Mm -hmm. um, Dallas has as well, kind of a one-stop shopping for the development process. You don't deal with multiple agencies. They've been coordinated um, into one agency, and you just go to them, and they shepherd the entire process through. Um, now, in the case of California, you still have the CEQA issues that can come up at the last minute that can delay the process, but it, it's the certainty of knowing how long that process is going to take and or being able to monitor it if there has been a delay, you know early enough and you can plan for how much that delay is going to mean to the tail end of the development. Um, so those are things that communities are doing, but to be quite frank, it takes a high degree of social capital to make that work because within the same community, you can have vastly different perspectives. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that California has done in, in the last few years I think has really helped is made it easier to obtain permits for so-called in-law suites mm -hmm. associated. Mm -hmm. So it, where you- Accessory dwelling units. Exactly, so in more sing, pr predominantly single family areas yeah. um, where it has been a challenge to obtain those permits, um, you increase density by doing that. You have grandparents moving in in some cases. Um, kids. And, and <laughs> yes, and kids. You know, so <laughs> the when, the, when the grandparents no longer live there, the kids move in. Backyard. Um, True. But I mean, th those are things around the edges. But in the end, all these, there's no silver bullet. And we need to tackle this problem with multiple solutions, in my opinion. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I yeah. heard a comment. Yeah. So <laughs> I got, I got so, Go ahead so the it. first thing is on affordable housing. So I slightly disagree. I'm a developer. Believe me, I want a speed it up process. I work in Denver. I want more transparency in the process. But it costs $450,000 a unit to build affordable housing in New York. It costs $750 to $1 million a unit to build it in San Francisco. And transparency in the process isn't going to cut the San Francisco right. unit cost in half. So number one, and the issue is that the cost of construction, the cost of land, it's, mm -hmm. money cost is actually pretty cheap these days, yeah. mm -hmm. but uh, simply does not align with incomes. And at some point, we should talk about we actually, the part of the problem with affordable housing is people who are working cannot afford housing. Right. So the incomes are too low relative to the housing cost. But so number one, the number one tool that we use to produce affordable housing in America is the low income housing tax credit. And we only allocate enough, about $6 billion a year, to produce 50,000 units. So we need to increase that by 10 times. You know, you think about how much we as a federal government spend on all kinds of other things. You think about the jobs that are created. There's all kinds of studies. The, the economic impact, the, the cost effectiveness of doing so is tremendous. Uh, the tax credit is an incredibly efficient program in which corporations such as Berkshire Hathaway and Google, et cetera, and, and Wells are the ones buying the tax credit. It's, it's a very, very efficient program with very, very few government employees. Fairly low risk. Uh, and very low risk. So number one, we need to t multiply the resources by at least 10 times. We also need to multiply, uh, so the low-income housing tax credit, the 9% allocation, and the allocation of 4% low-income housing tax credits, tax-exempt bonds. With so, so what, in your opinion, would enable that to happen, to do a 10x increase? Some, first of all, nobody's asked for it. So number one, I'm asking for it. So I literally, all the affordable housing advocacy organizations are so timid because we have been so beaten down. They go, look, can you mold it? Can you add 30 percent more tax credits? So that's the the current request in Congress is to increase the amount by 30 percent through some tricks. By the way, we need to ask for 10 times more. The the, the only, if there's a 20 million unit problem, we're only going to. And by the way, in the past under Reagan, the country built its way out of the affordable housing project with a massive Section 8 program. We can we can do this. 60 billion dollars a year of of allocation is. Is, a, uh, is reasonable within the cost mm -hmm. issues. So that's number one. Then number two is the where to build. And um, uh, the, 
again, America works with home rule, so every community gets to decide its own density, and we need to figure out. So for example, my instinct is the federal government, you would say state, but I'm pushing a lot of federal things, That's should fine. simply say we're not going to allow, we're not going to make federal investments in your water and sewer plants through the EPA SRF funds or in mass transportation, et cetera, unless you build affordable, you zone to build affordable housing next to it. On the local level, what we're seeing is a rise of what's called inclusionary zoning. So if you want a rezoning in New York City to build a luxury project, 30% of it has to be affordable. And the tax incentives work, so almost every rental project in New York City is built as a 75-25. It used to be 80-20, now it's 75-25. This again won't solve the problem, but it means every time that market rate housing is being built, and there's a shortage of that too, mm -hmm. um, affordable housing is being built in better locations and in mixed income communities, which is no is better for the outcomes for the residents. So those two things, the dramatic increase of tax credit and the zoning that, re that either encourages or requires mixed income housing, um, would be two very powerful tools. I live in one of those small communities, though, that's impacted by local decisions. Right. Mm -hmm. So I happen to live in a little small town that's a suburb of Charlotte. I've been there for 30-something years. I'd had less than 4,000 people when we moved in. Great public schools, one uh, elementary school, one middle school, one high school. Great public schools. Charlotte's exploded with um, growth in financial right. sectors and, and others. And so in 1996, the school board said, gosh, we need an impact fee. So we're going to assess $2,500 per unit to help pay for new schools. That proceeded. Charlotte grew. Uh, the impact fees started to grow. Um, there was a large single landowner that uh, owned a lot of the land. They did invested um, in a very uh, uh, philanthropic way and said, we're going to protect green space. All the things that appeal, right, to the communities. We're going to set aside protected green space. This is, and then we're going to develop. So development starts, impact fees continue to increase. The town jumps in and says, wow, we need to begin to plan here. They come in with an overall uh, plan about 10 years ago uh, with zoning um, uh, uh, changes and and begin to introduce affordable housing, impact fees are now up to $18,000. So the affordability question has been, I think, one of the things that's maybe lost out in this because of that confluence of, of local decisions in trying to keep up with explosive growth. We're now up to 30 or 40,000 people in this little community. So um, it is the impact of some of these local decisions in trying to deal with the needs of the residents in the community, the um, uh, issues of affordable housing, the growth, and then the lack of housing, right. uh, quite honestly, yes. um, that we're dealing with. So, so one so solution for that simply is for local communities to waive the impact fees on affordable housing. And, and the town is wrestling with exactly that. Mm -hmm. um, which is much better to do it outside of litigation than inside of litigation, right? right? right. So right. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's exactly that discussion that's happening right now in towns across America, particularly those that are in, um, that used to feel like suburbs and are now extensions of these larger um, markets. So let's talk a little bit more about um, community support. So I know you all have supported some research um, that demonstrates that a majority of uh, people in the community do support housing solutions. United Way here in Los Angeles has done similar with their Everyone In campaign that says um, almost 70% of people are open and supportive of having different you know, mixed housing in, the, in their neighborhood. So how does that factor in to, to you know, the equation for you? Well, sort of to Jonathan's point, years ago it wasn't even on the list. Mm -hmm. And now we did uh, partner with the Governing Institute and commissioned a study that came out late last year that said that something like 59% now of cities would rank it as one of their number one issues, and half of them would rank it as the number one issue. Mm -hmm. So we participate with community wins grants and others with mayors to go in and say, what can we do as affordable housing? Charlotte's one of those, where affordable housing has become one of the most critical issues on the, the local agenda, um, on the growth agenda, you know, broadly in partnerships, you're right, with organizations like um, uh, United Way, the role of nonprofits 
like Habitat and others who are in both not only the, the build space but the policy space to think about how can we use the collective power of all of those voices, it's not just one, right. but how do you combine it because there's, there is no silver bullet. Mm -hmm. Jesse, your yeah, thoughts? I, I, <laughs> I do want to say that I think there is agreement on the issue and I, I think that you see various stakeholders that say, yes, this is a problem, where there's not agreement or a vitriolic minority is in, I don't want the solution in my backyard. Mm -hmm. And I can speak more to the Bay Area context where we are involved in local zoning conversations in which I am just amazed to see people come out to their city council and tell them that they don't want those homes being built for poor people. They don't want those homes being built for teachers. And they, they it is either very uh, thinly veiled or not veiled at all. It's usually not veiled. And, 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 I'm, and I'm just, a, like it, I go to some of the, I went to a city council at Brisbane. Uh, this mm -hmm. is a community just south of San Francisco who has uh, a, a new, um, or not a new, it's an old uh, Superfund site. So it was, it was mm -hmm. previously polluted and, and now is being cleaned up. The city is, is a kind of bedroom yeah. suburb and, um, and they, they want no housing built whatsoever. About 20 minutes from San, 15, 20 minutes from downtown San Francisco. And they want none. They want to keep the character exactly the same. They're willing to have you know, offices, they're willing to have businesses come in and pay their commercial tax, but they're not willing to let, you know, rich people move in, much less poor people. So, it, and, and it, it's heartbreaking. And, and what I'm not seeing are the business community, is, or large businesses come Stepping out and up. step up and say, you know what, I want to see you build housing or we won't do business in this town. Mm -hmm. And we're starting to see it in startups. So. Um, uh, my fiance works at Stripe, which is uh, uh, one of those unicorn companies and um, uh, is now a large employer in San Francisco. They donated a million dollars to the San Francisco uh, YIMBY uh, coalition, so the Yes in My Backyard coalition. So we're, we're starting to see, um, and, and mind you, they called the police to this, uh, this Brisbane council meeting because it got so heated. Um, but I, I guess I, 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 I hear that there is agreement on the problem but what is um, both frustrating and, and, and heartwarming to see is that, is that big businesses haven't realized that they're gonna have to make some enemies. Yeah. And small businesses though, or medium size important uh, businesses are starting to step up and take sides. By the way, there's a fantastic solution in that. I happen to know this Brisbane case, which mm -hmm. is there's a large site and Brisbane said, we're gonna zone it for millions and millions of square feet of office and they said literally in the housing issue, San Francisco could provide the housing, which yes. is the most <laughs> ridiculous <you> know, statement. <laughs> bizarre statement to yeah. have made. Yeah. And what you what your idea is so if Microsoft and Apple and Google and a whole bunch of other people said, We will not rent in Brisbane unless you provide affordable yeah. housing, that would be the wake up call. And that's so five hundred million from um, Microsoft is, is is pretty good. That statement would be really yes. powerful. Yeah, I, I agree. That's what I meant with the adult in the room. Uh, but I think it, it, what the 500 million represents is they understand it's an important issue, but have not been willing to stick their head up yet. Yeah. It's going to take a few brave souls that take a leadership position and stick their head up and understand it may get whacked. But if, if they don't get involved, Private companies, if they don't get involved, we're not going to solve this problem. I, I just don't see it. So can you uh, drill down on that a little bit more and go beyond just kind of support for additional you know, supply solutions and talk about um, wages, right? I mean, part of this is, as was mentioned before, you know, how do people afford, right. you know, how can we give people more living wages? Because they're both part of the equation, obviously. They are, and I mean, what's happened is that wages have been bid up in these coastal locations that have a lot of tech workers. Um, the service sector employer employees that support them, the wages have not been bid up as right. much. Um, 
look, the national minimum wage is so low relative to the prevailing wage, it's virtually meaningless in the coastal areas of the country. And even in the center of the country, states have higher minimum wages in, in most all cases than, than the national minimum wage. But it, it, it seems to me that part of the solution is to look at minimum wages that are localized relative to the prevailing wage. And California's been doing some of right. this. Now, what California did wrong, and I told them when they did it, you can't have a state prevailing wage, minimum wage, that's the same in Kern County as it is in San Francisco. It needs to be adjusted for the local cost of living, housing costs yeah, principally. LA has done a, a regional. E exactly, and LA's done that. So that's, that's part of the issue. Um, I mean, we have seen for the first time in this recovery that wages of lower income workers are beginning to rise faster than high wage workers. This has only happened in the last 18 months. Um, it's not going to reverse the problem, but part of the solution to the housing issue on the affordability side is to be a bit innovative in looking at setting minimum wages closer to a prevailing wage. But I would say you have to have exemptions for new entrants into the labor force yeah. so that you could have a training minimum wage mm -hmm. because all, all the studies showed if you, don't, if you jack up the minimum wage too much, it leads to youth, higher youth unemployment for some period of time. You don't <laughs> obtain connection to the workforce, which stunts your professional progression. So you've got to be very careful about how you do this. But I think a, a thoughtful analysis of looking at setting minimum wages locally relative to the prevailing wage has to be part of the affordability solution. It is a component. That will not solve it, but it will help. And just for context, because you mentioned uh, lower uh, wage workers are now gaining a faster rate, but since the recession, at least the data in LA shows that the um, bottom 60% of earners mm -hmm. have either been flat or actually decreased in terms of their real wages mm -hmm. and income. True. So, if you look so at the whole time period, that's the case. So I'm, yeah, exactly. I'm giving you a snapshot of some right. positive Right. I just want to put that into for context. For like, yes. It may be finally changing, but uh, it's got a long, long way to go. It does. Um, so I think we have just about five, six minutes left. So I want to get some, and we've covered a lot of ground, but there's still a lot to be covered. So any additional thoughts that we either haven't touched on or something you want to elaborate um, to, to really kind of give a different insight to the audience? Anyone want to start? So I'll just add, I was at a panel yesterday on the reform of um, Fannie and Freddie. And, and so the housing finance, uh, and there are currently plans perhaps in Washington to take them apart. And uh, that would really right. make things worse. So there, there are kind of foundational institutions that we need to provide low cost mortgages to people. Now maybe their mission needs to be refined and take them out of the high end of the market and just say that they're there to be providing affordable housing. That, that's totally fine with me. But they are really critical resources in providing uh, funding for both the single family and multifamily affordable housing markets. I would say even at the higher than um, capital A affordable, it would make our job a heck of a lot harder because in the last- it, Harder if they weren't there. If they weren't there. Right. It, so, so for example, we, we have to get approved, prior to Fannie Mae right. approving us as an eligible source of down right. payment funds, we had to go lender by lender in every market we wanted to launch and say, will you qualify us as an eligible source of down payment funds? And by the way, there's this overhang because we don't know what we can do with those loans because uh, it's not clear under in the Fannie Mae underwriting guidelines whether right. or not um, a down payment support provided by a private company is um, uh, a, a eligible source of funds. Um, so having Fannie Mae there um, uh, to, to kind of be a level setter and say, um, which it took us two years. It took us two years to get uh, Fannie Mae to say, you know what, we'll, we'll buy those loans. But now that they have, it means we can go to any city in the country, and up to that uh, conforming loan limit, um, we can um, provide down payment funds. 
in the jumbo market, it's still like we have some educators who are at that margin where they're just clicking over mm -hmm. from um, a, a, a Fannie Mae loan limit to the jumbo market. And all of a sudden, the number of lenders we can work with is just cut down. Because again, we go back to each portfolio lender um, having to, to make a decision. So having some consistency of ground rules, um, uh, at least in our, and I recognize it's not a universal experience, has been um, that it's helpful to have um, those agencies uh, there. One last thought I would have is on the policy side. And I think that state governments need to step up. And some have been doing this to have an appeal process to when, you know, no, we're not going to build any housing here of any type. Um, because it, we cannot address this problem when there are projects that make sense to put in specific areas, such as brownfield projects. Um, if the local community just says no, there, state government needs to have a process to appeal it. And I, I think that can send an important message to the local communities that may have a high level of opposition to, th to think again, maybe I shouldn't just say no, but maybe a little bit of housing we could accept. And that, that would certainly help. And the only thing I would add is this is going to take collaboration uh, mm -hmm. that we're perhaps not seeing naturally today in a way that's got to solve a problem that we've, we've clearly um, kind of ground in the fact that it's, it's complex and it's happening at all levels and it's going to take collaboration um, in a meaningful way across mm -hmm. all of these dynamics, whether it be the nonprofit community, um, uh, broad philanthropy, private, public, uh, to, to create some difference yeah. um, beyond just the, um, the incremental impacts and in, in, uh, programs that we're seeing. Yeah. Can I just say one thing more about that is that uh, people who agree on this uh, idea that we need more housing, um, I think need to get a little bit more aligned and stop arguing with themselves if possible. Mm -hmm. There's, there's um, a bill working through, I think it's SB 50 in California, um, that was proposed last, last session of state Congress yeah and got uh, shut down because of um, uh, there was, it was a constituency of, of um, low income housing groups that didn't think that the bill did enough. And, and sorry, a little bit of context. It, it's, a, it's a bill that says that it's easier basically to build uh, higher density housing around transit. Right. Um, and the, the bill was shot down last uh, session because um, there wasn't enough affordable housing included, um, which may be true, I, I, I actually don't know, and I, it, it very well could be true. Um, but I, I think um, there's a, a little bit of, we need to get aligned in the room around who believes in, um, in, in building more. Um, and I would just love to see us, uh, us get there, because um, yeah. we have bigger battles to fight with people who don't necessarily agree. Mm -hmm. So I think in closing, I mean, one of the questions that I keep coming back to is, what, what do we want our communities to look like? You know, do we really believe in shared prosperity in an right. authentic way? And do we really want to have mm -hmm. people who, you know, contribute to the economy at all levels be able to have safe, you know, place to live, a place to work, et cetera? And is that what we want? Or do we want more and more of the extremes? So we, I think we really have to think about that from all these angles and uh, what's the long-term vision that we share. So thank you for joining us, and the panelists will be around for a few more minutes if you have any individual questions. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for attending. Please make your way to the next session.